when you get introductions, can you hear me? All right. When you get introductions like that, you have to come back multiple times to hear it over and over and over. Thank you so much uh, for that warm and wonderful introduction. It's truly an honor to be here um, at the Oklahoma History Center, but also at the Oklahoma Historical or History Symposium. Uh, I certainly do trade have a passion for Oklahoma history, and I, in many ways, discover it here with the Legacy Committee within these walls where we meet uh, weekly uh, to try to understand and, and to find the best ways to remember uh, and pay homage to uh, a patron saint of Oklahoma and certainly of the Civil Rights Movement, Black Freedom Movement in Oklahoma, Clara Looper. Um, so thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And also thank you uh, for being here today to allow me to bear witness to Clara Looper and what I want to talk to you today about is Clara Looper's radical love. Clara Looper's radical love. And the reason I share Clara Looper's radical love is because I've come to know it through Marilyn Looper, her daughter, Calvin Looper, her son, but also the Legacy Committee have helped me to understand Clara Looper's radical love. And so what I wanna share with you today is what I call and what, what Marilyn and I talk about as the felt history of the Oklahoma City sit-in. Felt history of that movement that revolved around Mother Looper or Clara Looper. The reason why I wanna share the felt history, I want you to be moved by the stories that I tell you about Clara Looper and the sit-in movement in the interest of continuing to do the work connected to Clara Looper's legacy, right? And so I think the best way for us to know truly who Clara Looper is, is to understand her and the radical love, right, that she bestowed, that she gave to the world, but most certainly to her students. And so that's the content of my conversation today. Do you need me to, to do something? All right, there we go. Are we back? Back? Thank you. Um, the goal is to talk about those things connected to Clara Looper's radical love. Before I do that, I need to ground myself in why I'm gonna talk about it and how I can talk about it. Uh, it's very important for me to do that. My grandmother would always say, tell the people who you are. Don't assume that they know who you are. Tell the people who you are, right? And so for me, the way I do that now is to try to ground myself in why I'm doing this work. And so I began uh, to really understand Clara Looper's life and legacy in 2016 when I had the opportunity to ask Marilyn Looper if we could name uh, our department, our Black Studies Department at OU in honor of Clara Looper. And so in the conversations that unfolded over several months, um, it felt like forever <laughs> convincing Marilyn to think seriously about this possibility uh, but again, uh, this was something that had never really been considered or discussed, and so she needed to take time. And so in that process, I came to know and respect not just Claire Looper, but also Marilyn Looper uh, in the process, so much so that as a, as a part of the department being named in honor of Clara Looper, I promised her that I would be committed to researching and writing about the life and legacy of Clara Looper. And I told her that because I knew we did not have, the department did not have the, the university. I talked to uh, President Boren at the time to try to convince him, can we do something? And he was like, we have nothing, Dr. Hill, right now, now at this moment. And so what I could give her, right, was my commitment to research and write and tell the story of Clara Looper. And so that's what I've done or tried to do and I've done that by and large by being on the Clara Looper Legacy Committee 
over the last six years or so. And as a part of that legacy committee, we have been able to not only commemorate the life and legacy of Clara Looper in Oklahoma City, we've been also been able to make the case nationally for why Clara Looper should be considered right, a patron saint of not only the Oklahoma City sit in movement, but the civil rights movement, the black freedom movement writ large. And so in so many ways, we've been able to do all of that work. I've been able to witness all of those things by virtue of being on the legacy committee. And, and being on that committee, I've learned the love that her students have for her, the radical love that they have for her. And I want to talk to you about that. I've also learned the felt history of the movement, what makes the sit-inners really proud about what they did, what makes them sad about what happened or didn't happen, what has them to this day traumatized um, because of the violence right, and the threats of violence that they endured. I've been able to sit with them long enough to truly imbibe the spirit of Mother Looper and the most important stories, not just to them, but to her, right, and why telling the story today is so important. I've gleaned that from them. And so it's a tremendous honor to be able to share some of that, right, that I've had the good fortune um, to learn directly from the senators. Marilyn Looper, in so many ways, I wish she was here. Um, she is so busy, she cannot be everywhere. Uh, but uh, I told her, I always call her before I'm gonna talk about her or her mother to get some inspiration. And so she, um, in so many ways, uh, wants people, wants me to remind people to vote, right? If Mother Looper was alive, May 3rd, we will celebrate her 100th birthday. If Clara Looper would be alive, a common question is, what would she be telling people? And Marilyn Looper would say res resolutely to vote. And not caring who you vote for, but just vote and be a part of the process. And so in so many ways, that's a part of um, Mother Looper's, Marilyn Looper's radical love, just encouraging people right, to be a part of the process, not caring which way ultimately they fall, but just that they are included and, right, and are represented, voices are heard, democracy, right, occurs. This is Clara Looper. I wanna shift, because I recognize we, before I talk about Clara Looper's radical love, if I can change the slide here. I knew that would happen. <laughs> if we could advance, if you don't mind, to the next slide, thank you so much. We are at a Oklahoma History Symposium, and Clara Looper was a history teacher. She was a master history teacher who taught at multiple high schools throughout Oklahoma but began her teaching right at Dungy High in Spencer, Oklahoma where she taught black history right to not just Spencer and uh, students in Spencer but ultimately students in Oklahoma uh, City, John Marshall Classen. I want to begin with her words and to ground my presentation in her words about the importance of black history because I think we can see in some of her words about the importance of black history, her radical love. Clara Looper, and I should just say, this is taken from the new edition of Clara Looper's Behold the Walls commemorative edition that'll be published in July by the University of Oklahoma Press. We have some members of the press over here. Thank you, Stephen and Katie. Yes, indeed. I wanna begin with a quote from that new edition, the history of black Americans encompassed every event in American history. Often unnoticed and unwritten, yet today black history stands erect clothed with a full panoply 
of documented facts. As we stand today at the threshold of a new, bright, and exciting day, we must constantly look back on the darkening shadows of the past. We must understand, this is the history teacher, we must understand dates and the events that record the energy, the determination, and the ambitions of our people. And so what we can really take from this quote, right, from Behold the Walls, Clara Looper, trying to help not just her students, but us to understand the importance of history. We must understand the day so that we can record the energy, the determination, and the ambitions. We can be inspired by the history. We can be actualized by the history if we know the dates and the events. We cannot be impacted by the history if we don't know the dates and the events, right? And so knowing for Mother Lupa was a pathway to caring and being transformed by the history. And in so many ways, we can understand or begin to understand her radical love by how she loved her people and the accomplishments and accolades of her people. She taught that to her students to inspire them to live their very best life, right? That is what this, uh, this um, statement is really ultimately all about. Who was Clara Looper? I really would love to go deeper on that. If you could move to the next slide. Clara Looper certainly was a history teacher. She primarily taught history, but if you talk to her students, they will tell you she taught everything to them. She taught them etiquette, she taught them English, she taught them the most important things in life, how to live, right? That's what Clara Looper was truly to them. But in terms of her actual role, she was their high school history teacher. But to really understand who this woman was, I think we have to put her in the largest context. And Clara Looper, for me, right, was someone who was a servant leader, right? We have to think about her as a servant leader who centered transcendental love. I'm calling it radical love because it's a shorter word. <laughs> but transcendent love is what she was all about, right? Transcendent love and, and wielding that wielding that in the service of justice, wielding that in the service of student empowerment, right? That, for, for Mother Looper, love and the transformative power of love is where, she, how she centered the students and how she centered her role in the movement, ultimately. And I've only really, truly been able to grasp this Right, by again being proximate with uh, members who were participants in the sit-in, but also reading now the words, right, of Clara Luper's Behold the Walls through the experience of, of sitting in meetings with Marilyn Luper and the Legacy Committee. I've come to really understand how transformative love, right, the transformative power of love has been right, for Mother Looper and all those who were connected to her. When we put Mother Looper and the students that she led in full context and we try to think about who ultimately she was, Clara Looper was a, a trailblazer, right? She was a trailblazer because on August 19th, 1958, Clara Looper and 13 students, 13 students between the ages of seven and 17, and I have my, my children here for great effect, right? <laughs> for great effect here. And I told them that I was gonna mention them, I was gonna embarrass them when I was on the stage, because that's what you do when you have the microphone, you embarrass, no. Um, 
And I have a lovely family, Nye and Nia, my wife Jenny, who's sitting up front. Thank you for being here. I bring attention to them because when Marilyn Looper initiated the Catch Drug Store sit-in, right, in August of 1958, her idea, when she initiated the idea, she was eight and a half years old. And my children are nine. <laughs> they are nine years old. And so that's helped me to really put into perspective just how much courage, right, and love it took for Mother Looper to organize, right, children, 13 children, between the ages of seven and 17, right, to walk into Catch Drug Store. 13 students between the ages of seven and 17 to walk into Catch Drug Store and not demand service, quietly sit down. And you can see here an image of what transpired, right? They quietly sat down and quietly waited to be asked to be served, not assuming that they would be served. They waited quietly on those segregated stools waiting to be served. And of course, they were not on August 19th or August 20th, right? But ultimately, right, because they came back, ultimately because they made it clear they would continue to come back, that only after two days or three days of protest uh, did the cash and drug store uh, chain decide that no longer would their lunch counters be segregated. And this is a direct result of the activism, the courageous activism of Clara Looper and 13 children, right, between the ages of seven and 17. The reason why this is such an impactful story when I have, as I have learned it from Marilyn Looper and the Legacy Committee is, they have told me often that they thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> Calvin Looper said actually to Marilyn and to his mother that you know what's going to happen when we go downtown. The white people downtown are going to mm, not be nice to us. They're going to they're going to berate us. They may throw things at us. They may get angry. They may get violent. This is not a good idea. We shouldn't do this. We should continue to petition the Restaurant Association and continue to talk. That's maybe what we should do. Maybe we'll have some headway. But Marilyn had a different idea. Her idea was to actually go down the catch drug store and actually sit in. Right? And that would be the thing that would force the Restaurant Association to actually talk to them about doing what they ought to do, be a force for integration versus a stalwart for segregation. And so in so many ways, uh, <laughs> Marilyn Looper was the instigator all right, of the longest uh, civil rights movement, or excuse me, sit-in movement in American history because what she told me yesterday was my, 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 uh, <laughs> my petition won the day, right? I out, you know, I, I, I won more votes uh, than Calvin. And so my, my petition to go forward went forward. And so, you know, we were able to make history, but she in so many ways said that she, even though that she won the day, she didn't know if the, 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 the sit-in would be successful. But what she, but what clarified it for them, right, was that they had experience, and these are her words, not mine, this is the felt history, they had experienced a taste of freedom. And she often says, she quotes Harriet Tubman, Marilyn Looper quotes Harriet Tubman, a little bit of freedom is a dangerous thing, right? And what she means by that is, she tasted a little bit of freedom, a little bit of integration on a trip to New York City in 1957, right? When Clara Looper 
and all of the NAACP Youth Council that all the NAACP youth he could take went to New York City to put on a performance of Brother President. And in the process of traveling to New York, seeing and experiencing the north, the you know the urban north, they for the first time experienced integrated restaurants and felt dignified in doing so. Didn't have to go in the back. Didn't have to get a sack versus sit at the lunch counter. And those experiences traveling to New York and then back to Oklahoma is what transformed them and gave them the courage to go into Cash Drug Store. That little bit of freedom, right, was a dangerous thing for children the ages of my kids, nine and Nia, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And so that little bit of freedom lit a flame for justice. And so not only that, Marilyn Looper often tells me that it took a mustard seed of faith, right? There was so little faith that going down the catch drugstore would do anything but get them into trouble, right? All they had is just this inkling of a faith that it would maybe turn the tide, right? Just nudge the tide in their direction, change the conversation with the restaurant association, change the conversation with the city, right? But with that, just that inkling of faith, what Marilyn Luper would call mustard seed faith, right? They went down the catch drug store and they initiated a six years long movement, right? And that six years long movement transformed America, right? And that's, that's my witness, if I have one, around the legacy of Clara Luper is that the movement that occurred here in Oklahoma City that was initiated here August 19, 1958, sparked a national civil rights movement, a national sit-in movement that changed America. That begins with Marilyn Looper's petition, as she would call it, to go down to catch drugs. So, and so in getting proximate with the members uh, of the Legacy Committee, but also the larger communities of sit inners I've learned, right, through understanding this felt history, why this history is so important to tell, right? Because Clara Looper is a national figure, we have to treat her uh, at this as a national story, and we have to bring more eyes to this story because the, the ways in which she impacted these children, and I wanna talk about how we hope to continue to impact uh, through her legacy today, um, I think that's the, the profound legacy of Clara Luper, how she continues to have impact today. If we could transition to the next slide, I really wanna make sure that I put Clara Luper's radical love into context. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting this dear brother, Desmond Mead, uh, recently uh, because he is a very important voting rights activist in Florida. Uh, he himself was incarcerated uh, for many years, and he um, was able to uh, get his liberation, get his freedom, and since he's been out of prison, he's become the foremost uh, advocate for, uh, for the voting rights of incarcerated people, what he would call returning citizens. And so I was able to interview him about what was happening during the, during the, election, the last election cycle, 2022, what was happening in Florida around incarcerated, uh, excuse me, returning citizens and his activism. But what I discovered in talking with him is radical love and his, the radical love that drives his activism. The reason why I'm telling you this is I was, as I was rereading, editing, uh, uh, Clara Looper's Behold the Walls, I was in conversation with Desmond Mee talking about radical love and the need for radical love in modern times and certainly for those people of conscience, right? And so in, in, in talking with him, trying to figure out his story, I learned something deeply about Mother Looper. And so if you could move to the next slide, I want to read you just one quote from a story that I did with this dear brother um, for the nation. Um, 
in which he helped me to understand why he is such a powerful activist for voting rights. He helped me to understand Mother Looper even better and her radical love. He says, quote, I believe that if I can get people to love the person they most despise, I'm gonna read that again. I believe that if I can get people to love the person they most despise, then they are capable of loving everyone. Being able to love those who despise me has given me a great deal of peace, personally and organizationally, it gives us power. It is easy to hate, but hate takes so much out of you than love does. When he said that, it just knocked me over. <laughs> it knocked me over because I was searching for the key to understand Clara Looper, and it was the transformative power of love, of radical love. Loving people, radical love for the definition is loving people despite how they treat you, in spite of how, however we want to say it. <laughs> Your compass isn't directed by how one is treated, it's just directed by love and loving whomever shows up right in front of you. This is what Desmond Mead has used, right, in his activism for returning citizens. Uh, he has said to me, uh, if you were to read the, the piece, that he's had to approach uh, doing activism this way because there's so many returning citizens who would deny him, right, the right to vote because of the color of his skin. But if he focused on that and only focused on the individuals who would vote for him or who would vote for Democrats or who would vote for the Green Party, then that wouldn't be transformative. That perhaps wouldn't even be generative, right? Because it wouldn't be expansive enough, right? And so for him, he's made it clear to me that loving people who would actually try to take away his vote has, 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 has amplified his voice, has strengthened his voice, has deepened his, his witness and his commitment. And so he talks here about the transformative aspects and the generative aspects of radical love. And I think this is what Clara Looper utilized so effectively with her students. And so if you could move to the next slide, I want to just share, um, I think, a really important aspect of the felt history of the Oklahoma City sit-in movement. Um, Marilyn Looper and, and many on the Legacy Committee referred to the campaign, the sit-in campaign uh, of John A. Brown department store that lengthy sit-in campaign as the Bunker Hill. And I don't know how many of you would, would appreciate that reference, and I don't know if I do. <laughs> but it, it is meant to kind of convey the, the degree to which the John A. Brown department store resisted, refused uh, to even be in conversation with leadership, Clara Looper. And so John A. Brown department store and the campaign to integrate it referred to as the Bunker Hill of the Oklahoma City sit-in movement. And I wanna share with you just how much of a part of the felt history this is. Anytime that you talk about the movement for an extensive period of time with Marilyn, the story of her relationship with John A. Brown's wife, or uh, Mrs. Brown, uh, always is at the surface. And the reason why it's at the, is always at the surface 
is because it was truly transformative, the relationship between uh, John, Mrs. John A. Brown and Mother Looper was transformative for the movement, not just for their relationship, but I think for the city of Oklahoma, but also for the movement. This image that you see here um, is a, an image of uh, the NAACP Youth Council engaged in struggle, engaged in actually sitting down, blocking the, the, the walkways in the store, making it really uncomfortable, making it really, making themselves a nuisance, you know, what we call today good trouble, right? They are engaged in good trouble here. And you can see even this, this is an OU student. We, we, we've called out an OU student here um, who is in struggle with Claire Looper, many of which, Claire Looper students, many of which are high school students um, in Oklahoma City. And so this is a, I would say, common image from the struggle, right? Uh, young people orderly sitting, engaged in good trouble, trying to perhaps provoke a confrontation with um, patrons in order to dramatize, right, the justice of their cause. But if not, if there is no confrontation, just sit there quietly waiting to be served, waiting, all right, for what, what, what Clara Lupa would call waiting for the walls to come down, right, by, by persistence, right, persistently making the case, right, the moral, right, case, right, the political case, right, for uh, desegregation. And so this, what's not in this frame, right, is that uh, the sit-iners were poorly treated, were pushed, were kicked, were spat on, were, were so many uh, hostile things were said to these kids that were, again, the ages of my children, um, because they were quietly but defiantly sitting in every Saturday in the summer and even during school on weekends, they were doing this. Despite that witness, after the success of the Catch Drug Store sit-in that I mentioned or I referenced earlier, despite that success, John A. Brown department store refused for almost what felt like, I think, a long four years to even talk to leadership in the movement and, and even Clara Looper. And so the refusal to even engage, uh, as many other um, businesses had, but refused to integrate, just the refusal to talk really embittered Mother Looper to the department store and particularly to uh, John A. Brown and Mrs. John A. Brown. So much so that when waters or when the ice thickened, or excuse me, began to melt and relations began to thaw just a bit and there was a possibility for a conversation between the department store and, 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 the, and the movement, because of the embittered nature of the struggle, Clara Looper refused initially. And then there was another invitation and refused. <laughs> and then a phone call and refused. Because it had become so embittered, not just because of how she felt, but because how she felt her students who had for years sat in and experienced some of the worst uh, anti-black uh, violence in terms of the things that they were said, in terms of the ways in which they were treated when they we're trying to prick the conscience of those patrons and of the uh, department store staff. And so the transformative moment came when Mother Looper decided, right, to in 1961 to actually meet in the summer of 1961, to actually meet with uh, Mrs. Brown. And this was a transformative conversation because truly, uh, it, it allowed Mother Looper to explain very deeply uh, to someone who was very influential in the state of Oklahoma the justice of the cause and why they, they were 
attempting to not just integrate her store, but all of downtown and all of America. And so the conversation really uh, truly turns when uh, after some small talk uh, in the offices of the department store, uh, Mrs. Brown asks Mother Looper directly, why do you hate us? Why do you hate us? Why, do you, why, are, you stro why are you constantly protesting in our stores? Why are you causing havoc, essentially? <laughs> and she stopped her cold and said, I don't hate you. I hate the segregation. I hate the segregationist policies. And she went on to tell Mrs. Brown that I, in fact, admire you. I admire your success as a businesswoman. I particularly admire how you've led the company in the death, in the aftermath of the death of your husband. I admire you, Mrs. Brown. I don't hate you. I hate the segregationist policies that John A. Brown perpetuates daily, uh, and particularly towards my students, right, who some of the most, the, you know, she, she was, this is the way in which she would speak, that the ugliest things <laughs> have been said to my students. And so that is what we hate, not you. And so that conversation was, was so transformative, right, that even before Clara Looper had left the office, she had declared that John A. Brown department store would no longer uh, uh, their policy would no longer be segregation. And so that, in so many ways, that story helps us to understand Clara Looper's radical love. And I just want to make sure I put a fine point on this. If we could move to the next slide. As Clara Looper was in struggle uh, with John A. Brown Department Store, as well as Anna Maude. I could give you a list of all the activities. That's why you need to read Behold the Walls, because it's all there, right? The felt history, or at least Clara Looper's memoir of the movement, it's there, the felt history according to her. But what I want to share with you right now is Clara Looper wrote an essay uh, that was encouraged by the NAACP uh, in the 1960s to clarify not only her position, but the position of activists like her, who were, who were guided by nonviolent civil disobedience, right? Who were guided by Mahatma Gandhi, and as well as Dr. King. Um, she wrote an essay entitled, Must I Love My Enemies? This is where I've really come to understand her radical love. This is not a quote taken from that essay, this is a quote taken from uh, Behold the Walls, the commemorative edition, uh, because I really want to, to, again, constantly take us back to her words. Um, she says, in answer to this question here, you must, and this is her invocation to her students, you must love your enemies, and the enemy is segregation. <laughs> The enemy, enemy is lynching and racial violence. The enemy is disenfranchisement. She didn't personify it. You must love your enemies and the personification of that, right? The segregationists who represent that. A doctrine as old as time, but as noteworthy as this hour's news story. You are to remember that you aren't up against a monster, right? Even though those children were dehumanized, we don't dehumanize. You are not up against a monster. You are up against a man who has been handed an overdose of segregation. Humanize a man who has been socialized to believe that black people are racially inferior and deserve to be segregated. She's saying you are up against a man who has been handed an overdose of segregation and who knows that segregation is wrong, yet practices it. You are not, and these are, these are instructions taken directly from her as if she were to say it to them before they would go to catch a drugstore. You are not to ridicule, humiliate, nor vilify him 
at any time or in any way. Keep your goal in sight. You aren't out to defeat him. Again, the enemy is segregation. The enemy is racial violence. You're not out to defeat him. You're out to establish justice. We must resist peacefully and in the spirit of love, radical love. Despite the treatment, the, uh, the, you being humiliated, you being vilified, you being ridiculed, as you are trying to get justice, do not return it in kind. Be guided by radical love. And that is, she says, I mean the highest form of love, that love that seeks nothing in return. And so in so many ways, Clara Looper grounded her students, Marilyn Looper, Calvin Looper, the original 13, the hundreds of students that followed after that created the longest sit-in movement in American history that not only transformed downtown, but also transformed America because it sparked the Greensboro sit-ins and all that came after that in February 1960. That movement that she initiated, that Marilyn Looper initiated, that was guided by Clara Looper was rooted in radical love for the very people who were denying them hum their humanity. Not just civil rights, but their humanity. And so if we could shift to the next slide. I wanna talk about, just briefly, um, Clara Looper's uh, radical love and its legacies. I often say to Marilyn Looper that the most potent legacy of her mother is the deep love that her students have for her to this day, right? And the ways in which they're still, right, transformed by that radical love that she bestowed upon them, right? They tell stories constantly about how she loved them. <laughs> how she loved them. That is their fondest memories of her. Not sitting in at Katz, the historic nature of that. Uh, not the successful campaigns that follow. It was how she loved them I and mean, the generative power of her love. And so when we, when we think about Mother Looper and the way in which her radical love is visited upon us today, part of that has to do with the Freedom Center, right? And the creation of the Freedom Center following the kind of end of the, 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 the movement for integration or integration, integrated public accommodations. The, the movement shifted, right? And, and one of the things that I've, I've learned from Marilyn is the point of the movement is to keep on moving. We don't stop once we get to moving. <laughs> the point of a movement is to keep on keeping on, keep on moving, right? And so the Freedom Center was, was, a, was Mother Looper's effort to make sure the movement kept on moving and institutionalized uh, in so many ways, the community that had been born, right, in that movement that began in 1958, stretched all the way to 1964, desegregated public accommodations in downtown Oklahoma City before, I say in record time, before, right, the 1964 Civil Rights Act that, that went into law in July of that year. And so, that's her legacy, but the Freedom Center was meant to enshrine it and ensure there was a space for her students to continue to be in struggle. And so Claire Looper's legacy has been right, firmly in place, held in place, because her students have remained engaged in struggle right, in Oklahoma City and throughout. And because of that, um, because of that, I've come to think about uh, the work that Mother Looper did uh, during the 1960s as, you know, and this goes back to her hearkening back to her being a master teacher. Uh, Clara Looper, what she really did 
and what, what's one of her most profound legacies is as a master teacher, she was able to turn a sit-in movement into a veritable classroom, right? Marilyn and I talk about that classroom as freedom's classroom, right? Because in that classroom, she taught a generation of black, young black people, right? How to be in struggle while centering radical love. How to be in struggle and at the same time figure out a way to love yourself and those who despise you. That was what Freedom's classroom was all about. And you know, when I say she was a master teacher, she could turn any learning, any experience into a teachable moment. And certainly she could turn any experience, right, right, into a classroom, right? Marilyn tells me all the time, my mother would send me into the cotton fields to learn about our people's history. And I said, how did she do that? She was saying, <laughs> because it was hard work and we've only done hard work. I mean, it's in that very guttural way she would try to teach uh, aspects of um, African American history because of what I began with, the importance of black history and inspiring, right, young people Right. What if you have only been in the fields for eight hours? What was it like for enslaved people to spend their entire lives, but yet create community, create songs, create joy as well as experience trauma? All that happened. Right. In in going into the cotton fields and seeing how hard it was, there's a way in which you're transported to that time, and you can kind of it was what Marilyn would say, walk in someone else's shoes. Right. And so that's. Claire Looper as a master teacher, that's Claire Looper and Freedom's classroom, right, as this space where Claire Looper taught a generation how to be in struggle and why, most importantly, why they needed to be in struggle. And this leads me, and I'm wrapping up here to my last slide. The goal that I'm really engaged in now is trying with, with the and Freedom's Classroom, again, as a space, right, where you try to transform young people through Clara Looper's understanding Clara Looper's radical love, and in some ways, trying to bring that to fruition in the work that they do. And so trying to extend that Freedom's Classroom into the present has led us to the creation of the Clara Looper Teachers Institute as a way to educate uh, teachers initially, but ultimately students about the life and legacy of Clara Looper. Um, because we believe Clara Looper's life and legacy is so transformative, we believe that teachers need to know about it, students need to care about it, right? And so we're really engaged in, in making that happen uh, so that we can again, we can again uh, ensure that today people understand and are impacted by Claire Looper's life and legacy. I want to, I began with Claire Looper's words, I want to end with her words. Um, this is a poem entitled Behold the Walls, and the poem Behold the Walls um, is actually the title of her memoir of the movement. And I wanted to end with uh, this poem because it does help us to understand what the book is about, but it also helps us to understand who she really was. But it also gives us a sense of what she would require of us today if she were in this room. She says, behold the walls. Do you see what I see? Visible walls, invisible walls separating you and me. The visible walls are crumbling as court decisions are handed down. The invisible walls are standing, making us go round and round. Each of us must be a Joshua blowing up our, blowing our trumpet of freedom's songs. And the walls will come tumbling down and the world will write the wrong. What Clara Looper encourages us to do, each of us 
must be a Joshua. We must bear witness. We must blow our trumpet of freedom songs when we see injustice happening. If we can do that, each of us do that, bear witness to injustice when we see it, when we come in contact, if we blow our horns all at the same time in unison, the walls will come tumbling down and the world will right the wrong. And so that is her invocation to you today. Behold the walls, I'm gonna stop. Thank you so much, thank you so much, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful experience to talk to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.